morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you. I'm going to start with a verse. This is how your Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said. Now, thanks Tom. Um, during our first hymn, we're going to take the collection. And our first hymn is going to be Holy, Holy, Holy. I'm going to play on the video the version we did when we did the worship in church. So it's got, although we're singing about God's holiness, then there's that, there's that extra bridge when we actually sing to God <coughs> and we sing, We bow before thee, thou art holy. So Tom, we're going to, after the introduction, we're going to stand and sing, Holy, 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 we bow before thee. <coughs> Still going to sing. Yes. Raise your voices. Let's
Holy Lord God Almighty. Loving Father, living God, we come before you with our thanks, with our praise. You are worthy of our praise. You are great and you have done so many things for us in giving us life and breath, in giving us your Son to be our Saviour so that we could stand here now forgiven in your presence. We thank you for your greatness and we bring you the praise that you deserve as best as we can. We thank you for the collection, for the offering that has been made. We thank you for each other. We thank you for our church and our community. And we pray that you will bless us as we seek to worship you and serve those in our families, our neighbours, our friends around us. Help us, we pray, for your glory we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Prayer time. Right, well, let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that we're here in your presence. We thank you that, amazing as it is, you know what's on our hearts, our minds. You know what we're going to say before we say it. And you bend down your ear to graciously hear our prayers. And you answer our prayers in your goodness, in your mercy, in your grace, and in your timing, and for your glory. We thank you for the prayer chain that um, Wadey operates. We've got the opportunity to let people know what's on our hearts, something that has happened, and then we can all pray together. We thank you for Graham's quiet. We thank you that Patrick's out of hospital. And we know there's still treatments and things to get to the bottom of, but we pray that you would encourage and bless him and know that you are working in his life and to know that prayers are being heard and answers. And we pray for this other <coughs> choir member that's been mentioned, Eric. One infection on top of another, perhaps then feeling the effects of one and not fully recovering. We pray for his health. We pray for whatever treatment he needs. And we pray that you would be a blessing and an encouragement to him as you, in our prayers and in your goodness, bring him again to good health. And we pray for Nick and Anne, we thank you so much for them, we thank you for their friend Julie, and you know the treatment that she's facing, and you know how unwell she's feeling, and we pray that that treatment would do what it is designed and purposed to do, and that it would bring um, a healing that she needs. We pray for whatever anxiety she's feeling, we pray for the tiredness she's feeling, we pray more than anything that she would know that you are a God of love who cares. And if she doesn't know you, it might be an opportunity for her to turn her mind and heart to you as well as praying for this physical healing in her body that we ask for. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the opportunities to share your word and your kindness and your goodness. We pray especially for the young children who come um, on a Wednesday to the kids club. We thank you for... Shane and Yanker and their family and the children that we've got with us today as well. And we pray for the work of the children that you would reach to their hearts. That while they're young that they would, as it says in your words, that they would turn to you. They would remember their creator and they would turn to you and find faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the older ones are rock solid. We pray that you would help them to stand in their faith and grow in their faith. And we don't just want to pray for the children. We want to pray for the families. The the mums, the dads, the guardians that come along. And we pray too that as they sit in and listen and hear your word, that you would open their eyes and their hearts to you. So many troubled situations that we um, <coughs> don't know everything about, but you know their, their difficulties as families, and we pray that you would help them. And we pray that we will be a blessing to them. And in that, we thank you for Colin, and we thank you for this prayer we can always pray. Lord Jesus, and should always pray that you would open hearts and minds and we would see a turning again to you. So many have turned away from you, the living God, to worthless things. And we pray that in your spirit and through your word there would be a movement again to turn hearts and lives and families back to you. We know, Lord Jesus, you are coming soon and you will put all things right. And until you do, we pray that there will be a dawning on the lives of Children and adults, young and old, not just in this country, but across our world. We pray that you would save people, Lord Jesus, until the day when you come back and you rightfully reign and rule. 
Bless us then, we pray in our service this morning. May you be glorified in it. Father, we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Notices. This is where I always have that slightly nervous look around to make sure I've got it right and you know how we are with that. So Tuesday, it's a Bible study week this week. We're in the third chapter of Ruth. And the roast that I've got says we're hosting. So it's at ours. If you don't come along and you want to know where to come along or you just want to come along for the first time, um, let us know and it would be lovely to see you there as we look at Ruth chapter 3. Wednesday is Kids Club and Rock Solid. We're fast running into half term so there'll be a break soon. But Kids Club at 6.15, Rock Solid at 7.30. Next week it is a communion service and Keith is coming again to help us and we'll agree who's leading, it'll probably be Andy, so I'm on the piano, but Keith will be coming along next week, so we look forward to having Keith with us. And the other thing I should say is it's a fellowship lunch day, so if you can stay afterwards, when the service is over, we'll rearrange the room, of course, and you can stay for what the food's been prepared. So there we go. Right, <clears throat> I'll do a quick introduction before we sing again. Um, now I know that not everyone necessarily would have been here last time I took the service, which was the 14th of Jan, and I don't want to spend a long time doing a big recap, but you've got the video and the newsletter if you want to go back. But what I said I was going to do was a new series for this year and into 2025, God willing, and we're going to look at the story of redemption traced through the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So we're going to touch on not everything, because that would take us... 100 years probably, rather than a couple of years, but we're going to touch on the main things. So just as a reminder, last time we looked at eternity, the eternal God. That's from Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we looked at how our eternal God has a plan for us and for his world that he's made. He has a purpose, and we concluded by thinking right at the end, at the end of time, beyond this life that we live, where we will spend eternity. And we looked at that. And I did say that this week then, and we read Genesis 1, so this week we're going to go back to the start of time, so we've come out of eternity into time, and we're going to look at creation. We're going to look at creation. And the next hymn that we're going to sing now I had a little look at this, it's the 75th anniversary of How Great Thou Art. Now it all depends when you have the first date for that, because really it goes back a lot older than 75 years. But it's 75 years this April since How Great Thou Art was published in its current form. There were previous forms. So it's a great song about how great our God is. It's a great hymn that touches on creation and the story of redemption when you come to the cross and when you come to the new creation that is coming. So I'm going to go down to the piano for this one and we are going to do How Great Thou Art. So please stand and stretch your voices. <clears throat>
voice hasn't given out yet because we're going to sing again in a minute. But we have a great God to sing to, and that's an important part of the subject we're looking at this morning. Now I want to do a brief introduction before we dive into the creation story itself. And I think this is an important introduction for everything that I've got laid on my heart before God to do. So we're going to be digging into all year into the Old Testament. So, to help us keep focus, I want to suggest three helpful things as we look back into the Old Testament. Three helpful things. And they'll apply this morning as we look at the story of creation to keep us on track. The first is this. It's Paul, through the Holy Spirit, talking in Romans 15. And talking about the Old Testament scriptures, Paul says, For everything, so that leaves nothing out, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So that's the first principle I want to apply as we go through the Old Testament. It's not necessarily all about us, but it is there to teach us, and it's there to show us endurance, patience, and encourage us. And the outcome of going through the Old Testament scriptures is to bring us hope. So we're going to be looking, how can what we read encourage us, teach us, and give us hope? The second important principle as we look through the Old Testament is found in the words of our Lord Jesus. He answers the question, what's the greatest commandment that he's given? And this is how he answers. Jesus replies, this is from Deuteronomy 6, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then from Leviticus 19, and the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. Now you'll see the bit that I've understood, we've not moved on Tom, thank you. you see the bit I've highlighted, I think this is astonishing, but then Jesus says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He doesn't say the law, he says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So everything in the big picture of the Old Testament, somewhere it's pointing us to love God with all our hearts and to take that love and pour it out to our neighbours. Everything in the Old Testament hangs on that, Jesus says. So we're going to think about that as we read through the Old Testament as well. And lastly, we're going to think about Jesus. So in the resurrection story about the two on the Emmaus Road, Jesus, of course, says this to them as he's conversing with them. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Again, all pointing to Jesus. So as we go through creation today, as we go through other stories in the Old Testament, God willing, in the future, we'll be looking to bring encouragement and hope. Next one, Tom, thanks. We'll be looking to see how it points to loving God and loving each other. And more importantly, we'll be looking to see how it points to Jesus. Because that big story of redemption on the diagram put up, wherever we are in the Bible, we're either looking forward to the cross and the new heavens and the earth, but we're in the New Testament, we're looking back to the cross and looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. There's so much more in it, but that's the big picture. That's the main focus. So, we're going to sing one more time before we look at that. And there's a song, it's a really, really old song, yet a really, really new song. And that's how God works, isn't it? He's old, yet ever new, as the old sing, song says. And we went to a concert last weekend, I was speaking to some of you about it, a Northern Irish band called Wren Collective. And the worship you get in one of their concerts, the best word I can use to, excite, to describe it is exuberant. I don't mean it's over the top, but we are to praise God with our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And I'm going to read you Psalm 148. It's an old hymn, and then there's this bridge in the middle. Don't worry when 
the, the, the video goes up an octave, we'll stay down, because I can't go up an octave, but, but we'll manage. And this is what Psalm 148 says, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to raise our voices in hallelujah and praise to our Creator God, with all creatures of our God and King. This is what Psalm 148 says, and we're going to join in this in a few minutes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, Creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples. That's us. Princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men and maidens together. Old men and children. That's us. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. It's good sometimes to be quiet. It really is good. And sometimes it's good to sing as loud as we can. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So join in. It's on the video. And they say, it's a well-known old hymn. There's just an extra bridge in the middle. But it's going to help us give our praise to our wonderful God. We're going to sing all creatures of our God and King.
creation. I'm going to start with a very similar question to how I finished last time, if you were here. So last time I said, when it comes to whatever is after this life, there's two options. There's either nothing, or there's something. And we explored what the Bible says that something is. When it comes to the question right in origins of our world, of the universe, of humanity itself, there's two options. We either came from no one, or we came from someone. There's only two options. No one or someone. I've not put the option, nothing or something, because to me, as an engineer, and in that sense, a scientist, you don't get nothing out of something out of nothing. It's against the laws of physics, it's against the laws of thermodynamics, which is what I'm trained in, working for a certain company in the city. So the option is <laughs> a no one or someone. Now many today will tell us it's no one. It's all random. It all just sort of happened. The thing with randomness is randomness, true randomness, is a little bit pointless. It's a little bit futile, and I think believing there is no one is devaluing to us as a human race. Now, I'm not going to do a talk on evolution and creation or any of that, because our main point is to be encouraged and find hope, to love the Lord our God, to love our neighbours, and to see Jesus. But I wanted to start here. It's no one or someone. If it is someone, it's going to make a really big difference to how you see this life and how you live this life. So this is a really important question, what we believe about origins. And do we know? Well, we do know, but we don't know everything. Now, as we go through, I'm going to put lots of Bible verses up, and eventually we'll get to Genesis 1. We will get there. This is what Job says. This is one of my favourite passages about creation. Now in the newsletter, I'll list all of these because we can't do it justice in one morning. So if you want to dig a little bit deeper, I'll put a new section in the newsletter. You know I put this on this. I'll now put a going deeper section with all the Bible references. But whether I believe in God or whether I don't, this is an important principle. At the end of Job, the Lord appears to Job and he says... Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. It's easy for me, as a Christian who believes in a God who created the heavens and the earth, to imagine some of the more famous atheists standing before God, and God gently but forcefully saying to them, in your ignorance, where were you? How did you know? But I need to take it on board as well. God is God and he is so eternal and wonderful that when we think we know everything about how we do creation <laughs> and this and that, we may be us treading on the same ground. We weren't there. But it's an important principle, isn't it? We know... We believe as a church that God created the heavens and the earth, but we don't know everything about it. But the important thing is that God did create. But if we believe someone <coughs> is responsible for everything we see, we were having a chat on the dinner table. Sam went to a design museum in London um, on Friday as part of his design course that he does. And you might think that you've driven in a car that someone designed, or we have designers where I work because they designed this thing. Someone designed the chair you're sitting on. Someone designed the microphone that we sang to. Someone designed the table. Someone designed the piano. Everything around us has come from something and from someone. That's the principle that we live in. But what would this someone look like who made the world? What would that someone look like? We're going to look at that from the Bible. Psalm 19 is where we're going to start. And you'll see I've underlined some words that we're going to summarise at the end. Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. 
Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. That Psalm 19 tells us something about what this someone would be like who has made everything. There's a great passage about creation in Proverbs 8, and I'll mainly read the second part, but it's talking about wisdom. And it's talking about Jesus. The Lord possessed me, that is wisdom, at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. And let's go on to the second part, Tom. So you're quite a bit, sorry Tom, we've done Psalm 90. Please keep up. So let's go on to the next one. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. So God says to Job, were you there? This wisdom, this Jesus was there. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the seas its limits, so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. We've got one more, then we'll summarise. Go to the New Testament, this is Romans chapter 1. Come back to Romans chapter 1 later, but it's a really, really important passage in the New Testament. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is writing to the Romans about the world that he was living in, which is so much like the world that has turned its back on God that we live in. And right there towards the end, it says... For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So let's summarise. I think it makes much more sense that we come from someone rather than no one. If you want to debate that with me and discuss it, I'm happy to do that afterwards. That's not my point today. But that someone would look very much like God, when you think about it. And I know we've turned to the Bible. This someone, who is capable of making everything, all of its diversity and wonder, think how glorious they need to be. We saw that in Psalm 19. Think how creative they need to be. In Psalm 19, we learn about this person would have to have knowledge. They would need to be supremely intelligent. We've read in Proverbs 8 about wisdom. Think of the wisdom, not just the intelligence, the wisdom to know what to create and how it would all fit as a system together. He's a master craftsman. Think of the attention to detail this someone would have to have to do all of this. The excellence he or she, but he in this case, would have in producing something that is not just okay, it's excellent. They're a master craftsman. The delight and enjoyment this person would have in what they have created in all of its wonder. I love that bit in, in, in Proverbs 8. The joy of creation. The joy of, we know the joy of doing a job well. I can't stand DIY. But those of you that do it, the pleasure you get in doing it well. The pleasure you get in doing a good painting, doing a good piece of craft. Whatever it is, the pleasure you get in making something. And Paul hits it through the Holy Spirit. This person would have to be eternal and unpaused. This person would have to have such immense power. This person would have to be divine. This person would have to be God. I'm not trying to prove to you that it's God. I'm just saying it's no one or someone. And to me it makes far more sense that it's someone and that someone looks like God. And that's the biblical record we've seen in. But either way, it's by faith. Hebrews 11 says it's by faith that we understand, that we believe that God made the world. But for those who believe it's no one, it's by faith that they believe it's no one. It's not rational. It's not a better explanation. As we said in Job, I wasn't there. I can't prove to you either way. But those who don't believe in God haven't got all of the rationality and logic. They're just believing it. 
Those who have faith in God believe through faith that God created the heavens and the world. So that's where I want to start. And I want to point to Jesus. So where do we come from? This someone, this God, who is so powerful, wonderful, wise, full of knowledge and excellence and joy, who creates, this someone is Jesus. Creation points to Jesus. When we dig into Genesis 1, you'll see that the word is a plural world. God is one God, but God, and we sang it in our hymn, didn't we? Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Holy Spirit, three in one. We sang it in holy, 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 the thrice holy God. And God says, let us make man in our image. Jesus was there. The Holy Spirit was there, God the Father was there, and as one they are all involved in this wonderful creation. You see it in Genesis 1. We've read Proverbs 8, we see it in Proverbs 8. You see it in John 1. Andy read Colossians 1 to us last week if you were here. You see it in Hebrews 1. That the person who is the agent of creation is none other than Jesus himself. I'm only going to read one of those, but there'll be the reminder in the newsletter if you want to get more to the bottom of this. John 1 says this, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <coughs> he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. We touched on the Emmaus Road story. It says that Jesus began at Moses and through all the prophets and told them concerning himself. I wonder if he started at Genesis chapter 1. I don't know he did. I wonder if Jesus started at creation. It would have made sense. So Jesus would have told those two people walking on the road, not knowing yet that he was raised, he'd have started with how creation talks about himself. Creation points to our Lord Jesus. Now, I don't know whether you've got a Bible with you. I'm not going to read through Genesis 1 and 2. But if you've got a Bible, you might want to open it. But I'm going to point out, and you're perhaps being familiar with it, things we can learn from the Genesis creation account. The first thing I think we can learn is that God is a God of order. You start in Genesis, and there's another passage in Jeremiah as well, and you get this idea that, I don't want to necessarily call it chaos, but order needed to be brought in creation. The earth was formless and void. God brings order. Which again, if you just strain me into my work sphere, when you have reactions, when you do things, disorder increases. It's a law of physics. Randomness doesn't bring order. God brings order. The other thing you'll know as you read through it, day one to six, is God constantly says, it was good. It was good. And then at the end he says, it was very good. The creation that God made was excellent. He was the master craftsman. The creation that God made, whether it's in the animal world, the vegetable world, the human world, whatever part of living life that God created, it was to be productive and fruitful. Our lives are meant to be productive and fruitful. We'll come to the fall next time, but when they don't feel productive and fruitful, that's because creation has lost something, because of the curse and the fall. I want to come particularly back to God making man in our, in his image. The other thing we learn is that man had a role. He was to rule with God or for God. He was put over all the creation. I haven't got time to go into Psalm 8. But he was put over creation. A man had a role to play with God creatively. You learn about marriage between man and a woman. There was something that wasn't good in the garden. What was it? It's not good for man to dwell alone. I'll make a helper, a companion, someone compatible to make him complete. 
And I don't know what would have happened if the fall hadn't happened as quickly as it did, and they would have had children, because the children were born after the fall. But it speaks to me too of community. What a wonderful community it would have been in this creation world if they had not fallen and had been fruitful and multiplied as God has said. You can see where I'm going with that, can't you? Love your neighbour as yourself. What a wonderful community it would have been. There was rest. God rested on the seventh day. It speaks of Sabbath. It's there mentioned in the Ten Commandments when we get that far. Sabbath. The creation was a place of rest. But it wasn't a place of idling around. It wasn't a place of leisure time all the time. Because they were given work to do. Man was to work the land. But not with all the sweat and thorns and thistles that came afterwards. He was to rule. Christ would be in Christ. Who knows what man, if there had been no fall, would have done with God in that creation world. Who knows what wonderful things God and man would have done together. Who knows? It was fulfilling work. Your work at some times will feel futile. That's the effect of the fall. It was fulfilling work. And when it finishes in Genesis 2, there was no shame, there was no guilt. You can add to that this, can't you? If you're thinking big Bible, you can think at the end of Revelation, and we're going to get to the new creation in a minute, but think of the things that there wasn't. Wasn't pain, wasn't poverty, wasn't injustice, wasn't any theft, wasn't any death, wasn't any need for police force, wasn't any need for the NHS as much as we love them. Think of all the things that we have in this world that there was no need of. It was perfect, it was Eden, it was a relationship with God. And let's come back to that central bit. Which I think is the big point. God makes man in our image. Let us make man in our image. What respect, what position of elevation does that put man in? Man is not like the beasts that perish, that it says in Psalms. We're not just another animal. We are made with the dignity of being made in man's image. This is at the root of all of human rights, whether the atheists like it or not. It's because we're made in man's, we're made in God's image. When I look in your face, when I look in the face of people suffering, people who are cruel to me perhaps, people who couldn't give me a second thought, dare I say it, when Jews and Arabs look in each other's face, Russians and Ukrainians, Democrats and Republicans, Conservatives and Labour, whoever it is, rich and poor, we're looking in the face of the image of God. Love God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. Man made in God's image for relationship with him and to love our neighbour as ourselves. It's all here in Genesis chapter 1. But it does look forward to the new creation. So I'm going to put my little chart back up again. You can't, well I can't anyway, I don't see how you can read the creation and think how wonderful it was without thinking what God is restoring us to. We're looking at the story of redemption through the whole Bible. God is restoring us to a new Eden. Dare I say it, a better Eden, even than the excellent, perfect one he created. And what encouragement and hope that should bring us as believers in the Lord Jesus. We look back to the origins. We look back to God creating us in his image. We look back to the relationship that Adam and Eve have. And think how we are enjoying that relationship partially now and can enjoy it completely and fully in the future. Now I'm going to rush to a finish. And I've got a final question. I'm going to take the time over it. So then, you might be thinking, that's all very interesting. So what? Why does it matter so much? Why does creation matter so much? First thing I'm going to say is, from a biblical point of view, it matters an awful lot. You read through your Bible, and I easily found 35 out of 66 books, 
Creation is everywhere. It's foundational. You can't read your Bible and say, well, yeah, I'm going to put creation aside. It doesn't work like that. Jesus spoke about creation. John did. Paul did. James did. Peter did. And that's just outside of the Old Testament. So why is it so important? We've got a verse coming up. This is Acts 14. This is Paul in one of those towns he went to. I've not written down which one it was. But as they have missed the point slightly of what Paul is doing, and they want to worship Paul and Barnabas with him, Paul stops them and he says, we're bringing you good news. This is the gospel. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. It's good news that there is a living God who made us and wants to be involved in the detail of our lives. It's good news that there is a living God who we can return to. If not, when we come in faith, who are we coming to? We're coming to the living God who created the heavens and the earth. And the world has turned away from this. I want to just focus on that <clears throat> turning from worthless things. I'm quickly going to return you to Romans 1. I didn't read it all. I'm just going to look at the bits I've underlined. This is the world Paul lived in. This is the fallen world that we live in. This is the secular world, the material world that have said, nah, don't want God. When you turn from God, you turn to worthless things, the opposite of the good news, which is turning from worthless things to God. And Romans 1 says here, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God and gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, it was empty, it was worthless. Although they claimed to be wise, and how we see that so much, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. That's the root of no one. It's a futile root. It carries on, on the next bit of Romans 1 to the end. They did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. God's judgment on that is it's worthless. They become filled with every kind of wickedness. And they not only continue to do these things, but they also approve of those who practice them. That's what we see around us in our world because they have turned from the living God to serve worthless things. Anything we put in the place of God is worthless. It's God first. So let's turn back to the good news. That's the worthless side of it. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. So if you've not turned to the living God, I want to strongly but kindly encourage you to do so. Turning from worthless things, the word is repentance, isn't it? To turn from worthless things to the living God. It brings us encouragement. It gives us endurance through this world that we live in. It gives us hope in this world. It gives us value as human beings in the image of God. It gives us an identity in Christ. It brings a new purpose and reduces the futility of living in a fallen world. But more than that, it brings us salvation. It brings us forgiveness of sins when we turn from worthless things and our sin to the living God and the Lord Jesus in faith and repentance. It brings us life. It brings us the promise of the new heavens and the new earth. And that's where I want to finish. <clears throat> Here is what I believe. Here is what Paul believed. Here is what Christians in this church believe. 1 Corinthians 8 says this. It's almost like a statement of faith. Yet for us, whatever else anyone else believes, I could always ask us to read it together. If you want to join in with me, feel free. Yet for us there is but one God the Father from whom all things came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, 
and through whom we live. That's what we believe. That's what I believe. And I've got one last verse for you. I put the context of Colossians 3 up so you can see it's in that wonderful passage about putting off our old life, being transformed through the gospel, and putting on our new life like Jesus. And this is how Paul finishes it. He says, don't lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with his practices, that's the turning from. And what have we turned to? We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. What a verse. That came up in our little reading we do before we go to bed a week or so ago. And I stopped in the tracks because I'm thinking about today and go, wow. That is the good news of the gospel, that God's working in you and me who believe in him. He's bringing us, renewing us in knowledge and he's restoring us to the image of his creator. He's right back in Genesis 2. God makes man in his image. And everyone still has the image of God stamped on them, but it's tainted. That's what sin and the fall has done. And the gospel is the good news that as we turn from worthless things to the living God, we receive his salvation, we receive his Holy Spirit and his forgiveness. He's renewing us to become like his image, to become like Jesus. I'm going to raise my voice here, so I'll warn you. I've written down, hallelujah. Praise him. Isn't it wonderful? I'm excited. I think it's fantastic. So, I'm summarising and then I do want to close with a hymn. Back to where we were last time and this time to put it together. Our eternal, living, loving God, he has a plan. His plan is our redemption through the death and resurrection of his son Jesus. God's got a purpose the purpose is our restoration to a full relationship with him through the death and resurrection of his son Jesus. He's bringing us to a new Eden, a better Eden, a new creation. So, back to those three points. Did we manage it? Be encouraged. Be encouraged. The creation story is an important encouragement to us. Our hope will be realised. Our patience and endurance will be have its fruit because faith will become sight. Jesus is coming back. If you've not done it, find your worth, your value in turning to the living God who made heavens and earth. Turning away from him is a worthless, futile exercise. Live those new lives as Christians that are becoming more like the image of our creator. More restoring us to where we should have been. Be renewed be restored. And that's why I believe creation matters. I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing a grand old hymn together. Loving Father, living God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we pray that you would open up our hearts, we pray that you would open up our minds, that you would give song and praise to our lips for how great you are for all that you have done. You are wonderful, you are full of wisdom and power and divinity, you are eternal and you have paid so much attention and detail. You hold our breath in our hands. But you didn't stay in eternity, Lord Jesus. What a stoop. You came down from eternity and stepped into our world, breathed our air, walked our dusty roads and streets, took our pain, took our death, took our sin. All so that one day we can look forward to the grand no more when you are dwelling with your people, when everything is put right, all injustice, all poverty, all death, all pain, all removed, and Lord Jesus, you are everything. Restored to a full relationship, worshipful and praiseful, working with you in all of those creative things that you have planned for us. We can't begin to take it in what you've prepared for those who love you. And Lord Jesus, we love you for who you are, we love you for what you've done and we pray that you would restore us day by day through your spirit that we are a better image of what you made us to be Lord Jesus to be like you bless us now we pray each one in Jesus name Amen
In Isaiah it says, Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad. Rejoice forever in my creation. I'm going to take time to sing the last song. It's Love Divine or Love Sex Selling. I'm going to jump down on the piano and you know the last verse. Finish then my new creation, pure and spotless. Maybe. So we're going to sing this and then we'll get set up for lunch. Love Divine or Love Sex Selling. <coughs>